Hello, dear viewers. We are going to see about the ecological theory of uh, motor control. This is being often asked by many people. Uh, I don't know because um, this is not properly explained in most of the literature and it is being mentioned in a very brief manner in most of the literature. And I, I'm just combining all these things to give you a crisp view on what is ecological theory of uh, motor control. I am Professor Arunachalam Prabhupada, Sairam Academy. And this is a continuation of all the motor control theories which are governing human body movements, just to give you an understanding how movement of human body takes place, just because we are all movement scientists, um, sorry, movement scientists who deals with the movements and we should know how the movement takes place for us to repair the movements. So without the knowledge of how human movement takes place, I don't think we can treat people with movement disorders. So the basic principle of uh, this ecological theory was emphasizing on the study of uh, interaction between the person and the environment during everyday functional task and the close linkage between the perception and action. So you perceive certain things, right? Before you do action, you perceive certain things. If you want to jump uh, a small gutter, you don't mind because your perception says that you can very well clear this gutter, you can just jump on it. In the same time, if the gutter is slightly wider, you'll be a little tentative and your movement strategies differ when you want to cross this particular gutter. So the perception about an action and the action execution is the one which was explained by the ecological theory and which clearly stated that this um, uh, the movement takes place taking into consideration of human perception about all the elements in the environment before doing an activity. So a clinical example, classical example for this uh, would be taken from a movie, which is a Hollywood movie by Sherlock Holmes. Robert Downey Jr. would have played that very, very, very um, clever guy in that particular movie where um, he used to close his eyes and imagine how people are going to attack him. What are the properties they have got like a, a wand or a, uh, a knuckle uh, puncher or something like that. He will just imagine and he will perceive things, how they are going to happen. And once he completes his perception, he'll get up, open his eyes and get up and he will fight all these people. And um, uh, all things happen according to his perception and he will defend them and he will defeat them. If uh, opportunity permits, please see that movie, which is a fantastic movie. Similarly, we also had some movies from uh, uh, South uh, where Kamal Hassan... Uh, played similar uh, action where he per the, uh, the exact reverse will happen in this movie. Uh, a fast forward uh, fight scene will happen. And after that, uh, they will show how Kamal Hassan perceived, what are all the properties people are having, how to attack them. And he will attack them accordingly, according to his perception. So classical example of uh, how perception plays a vital role in your movement and uh, uh, the skill what you execute. Fine. So in this theory, there are three important factors apart from the final decisive factor, uh, which decides the moment. The final factor I'll tell you later at the, at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, before that, we'll see three important factors. One is the anatomical factors. So we all know that uh, we all study about the kinesiology, biomechanics, and give due consideration to movements, uh, just giving consideration to the initial starting position. The starting position is very important. For example, when you are doing a shoulder flexion from a standing position, your deltoid has to contract concentrically to do the flexion, irrespective of whether you have a weight in your hand or you don't have a weight in your hand. The deltoid has to contract, the anterior fibers of the deltoid in particular has to contract concentrically to do this movement. Whereas when you are lying down in this prone position and you want to move the uh, shoulder in flexion, uh, the deltoid never works. In fact, uh, the deltoid uh, do not work. Instead, the posterior fibers, that is the extensors of your shoulder, eccentrically works to do the movement. The same movement, uh, but in different starting position, different muscle work happens. So what is the clinical implication from this you can take when you're training your patients is, uh, whenever you're training your patients, give due consideration to different context of uh, the movement. Uh, don't think that uh, if you train flexion from uh, sitting uh, uh, with uh, from a uh, short arc position, you uh, uh, you you can think that that can translate into a long arc position when you're when the patient is standing. Uh, likewise, 
the next important factor what you have to consider is the mechanical factors. There are various mechanical factors we have studied in the biomechanics, uh, like uh, the internal and external forces act on the human body, internal forces, in fact, that is the muscle uh, force that is created. Leave out that, apart from that, you have gravitational inertia, uh, the ground reaction forces, the mechanical advantage of uh, doing a particular movement, the momentum, and many more things which are environment-based also affects the movement. For example, simple example, when I'm standing, if I want to do extension of my shoulder, I need not contract my extensors because the gravity is not acting on my shoulder. So what I have to do is uh, I have to eccentrically control my uh, anterior deltoid to do a shoulder extension from this position because there is no gravity. So uh, the movement has to be limited. The movement has to be limited by means of eccentric contraction of the deltoid, anterior deltoid, which is the flexor of the shoulder. But still, it is working eccentrically when I'm doing extension. Whereas if I want to uh, take a load or pull the load backwards like this, or if I'm doing a fast movement, my extensors of the shoulder will contract. That is my uh, posterior deltoid will definitely contract. So the mechanical factor here plays a very important role. Second thing, the ground reaction force. There is a difference between me walking on a very skiddy surface and myself walking on a rough surface or uh, <coughs> beach sand. There is a lot of difference between the uh, movement pattern which I adapt. And then the mechanical advantage, if I want to lift 10 kg weight, which is placed exactly below me, my strategy would be different. If the same weight is placed slightly away from me, away from my arm's length, my strategy would differ. So mechanical advantage also plays a very important role. And the momentum, uh, for example, if I want to sit to stand, uh, the, the moment I bend forwards and immediately I stand up, it is going to be very easy. But the moment if I break this momentum, coming forward and uh, if I take a pause and then I want to uh, stand up, the uh, muscle effort is going to be more compared to the previous one. So if the movement is smooth and continuous, it is going to be less effort, uh, effortful. And if it is broken, again, the momentum is broken means it takes a lot of muscle effort and many more forces are acting on the human body. And this theory explained all these things uh, very well compared to the previous theories. And the finally, this theory said that, <clears throat> like how in the hierarchical theory it was stated, that movement control flows from top to down. This theory was also against uh, uh, this concept, like the system theory, that the movement does not take place with the command only from the brain. Yes, when the higher center sends down command to the muscle, the muscle contracts, but uh, if there is any obstacle, if there is any problem, the middle and the lower centers have the opportunity to modify the command. For example, uh, the brain uh, sends information to lift a metallic object. So the moment it instructs the uh, lower limb go and touch that object and it tries to lift it, if in case it is very hot, your spinal reflexes are on and the spinal reflexes just withdraws the hand back. It does not execute the movement simply because the brain has told to execute that movement. Here, the sensory information which are going from the periphery to the brain or to the spinal centers, not to the brain, immediately it goes to the spinal centers and immediately you withdraw your hand. This is called as the reflex. Sometimes the higher centers uh, command can also be uh, rechecked or corrected by the middle and the lower centers. That is what this theory said. Uh, and uh, very importantly, the one uh, factor I wanted to tell you, the last I said was the, the uh, improvement that happened in the later stages. This theory clearly said that there is a classical difference between doing certain things actually and pretending to do certain things actually. For example, we always say that, uh, so try to Mimic that you are eating. Imagine that you are having a biscuit in your hand. You just eat it, uh, try to eat it. The patience does the movement. But, but do you think the strategy adopted by the patient would be similar to that of actually eating a biscuit? That is not going to happen. That is what this theory clearly said. So when you try to mimic certain things, for example, he said uh, eating with a spoon and uh, eating with a spoon and pretending to eat like eat with a spoon, uh, the strategy differs. So I will give you one more example for this. Uh, when you are uh, 
when when batsmen try to practice uh, batting without the ball coming onto the bat uh, in the runners end they used to practice right they used to perfectly do that they used to perfectly mimic as if they are batting but in actual scenario when the ball is actually bowled at him the actual defense differs their footwork differs their body posture differs uh, so what is the uh, uh, clinical implication from this particular point is whenever you are trying to practice some functional task to the patient don't ask him to mimic give him the actual biscuit and ask him to take it to the mouth instead of uh, telling him sir imagine that you have a biscuit in your hand try to eat it because the strategy of movement differs because um, the brain takes a lot of uh, inputs from the instruments that are available the elements that are available uh, the furnitures that are available in the uh, ecology that is the universe and based upon that only our human movement is going to happen so signing off uh, with this uh, concept i'm coming up with dynamic systems model next so keep in touch uh, the the uh, tamil explanation of the same uh, theories of motor control has been asked if whenever time permits i'll definitely do that thank you so much for watching and keep in touch subscribe to our channel and spread knowledge as usual thank you so much